Hello, everyone, and welcome to the OAI SAE Additive Manufacturing Webinar. We have a great program for you today. And we're going to kick it off with a welcome from Alexander Minty from OAI. Alexander? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I know we're excited to have you here and uh, appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, I know this uh, is a continued partnership with SAE and OAI, and Kim was uh, being split in many different directions. So hopefully, I can do a quick introduction and replace. Uh, next slide. Oh, um, so yeah, Tuesday, June 21st, we are also uh, doing another joint meeting with the International Trade Administration uh, where we'll have uh, Lockheed Martin and GE Aviation uh, giving updates on the aerospace industry and how, how to uh, become a supplier. I know that they're looking to uh, partner with more small businesses and such here in the area. So if anybody was interested in uh, participating or being a part of that, um, we can uh, follow up with uh, with an invitation if you reach out to us. And yeah. Thank you, Alexander. And my name is Becky Lemon. I'm the industry program manager in aerospace standards at SE International, and I will be running things behind the scenes today. So we are recording today's webinar. It will be available online in a few days. <clears throat> We will be taking Q&A using the chat feature, so feel free to enter all of your questions into the chat box, and we'll do those at the end of this webinar. And we do ask everyone to remain on mute when they're not speaking. So we have a packed agenda today with our welcome and introduction. We have an overview of SAE's International Aerospace Standards Program from Jonathan Archer. Director of Aerospace Standards Strategy and Innovation at SAE. We have Bill Billman presenting an overview of SAE International's aerospace additive manufacturing activities. Bill's the founder of Aerolytics, and Bill's also going to cover the uh, SAE AMS Metals Committee in Additive Manufacturing. Then we have a presentation from Paul Jonas, the dire technical director of Firepoint Innovation Center at Wichita State University. Paul will present the SAE AMS Additive Manufacturing Non-Metallic Committee activities. And uh, Paul is also the vice chair of the Non-Metallic Additive Committee. We'll take a quick break and then we'll have a presentation from Pete Doty, the vice president of the Operations Center of Excellence for the SAE Industry Technologies Consortia. Pete's going to talk about the SAE Additive Manufacturing Data Consortium. Then we have Dave Abbott, the Senior Staff Engineer, GE Aviation, and the Chair of the SAE AMS AM Repair Committee Subcommittee. Uh, Dave will give us an overview of those activities. We move on to the Additive Manufacturing and NADCAP Aerospace and Defense Contractors Accreditation Program. Ethan Aikens will present that. Ethan is the Senior Business Development Manager in Aerospace at the Performance Review Institute, PRI. Then we have a presentation from Tim Davidson in Corporate Sales at SAE on the SAE Mobilis and OnQ Digital Standards Systems, followed up by information on how to get involved in SE's Aerospace Standards Program. We'll have some Q&A at the end, and then we'll do a wrap up. So let's get moving with today's presentation. We'll kick it off with Jonathan Archer with an overview of SAE Standards Program. Jonathan. Thank you, Becky. Next slide. Uh, good morning and welcome. Um, I'll give you, as Becky said, an overview Aerospace standards program. Jonathan, we're having a hard time hearing you. That's him, Becky. Can you hear us, yeah. Jonathan? Yes, is that any better? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Jonathan Archer. I will give you uh, an overview of uh, the Aerospace Standards Group 
uh, activities, uh, spe specifically being tailored to the additive manufacturing work that we're doing. But first, I'd like to give an overview of what SA International is, is doing and what we stand for. Um, as you can see on the screen, we've uh, identified 10 uh, areas of, of technology to help strengthen and focus our mission towards um, improving and developing um, benefits for, for, hu for humanity, um, providing uh, leadership in mobility and providing an environment where engineers and technical specialists can come together in a, in a neutral forum um, to build consensus standards. Um, come together as a global community and develop solutions that uh, move mobility and the community in a direction where we can improve um, our connectivity, um, advancing propulsion systems, uh, developing automation, making sure that uh, the cyber civic physical environment that those systems work in is protected and to engage and develop the workforce. It's not just about developing standards, we need to develop people alongside those standards. Uh, next slide, please. So who are we and where did we come from? Um, as you can see, we um, have been formed from the great and the good. Um, al although initially we were um, an automobile association, um, the aerospace community soon started to recognize that standardization was needed and Orville Wright was one of the initial members to start bringing together um, this community to join the automotive community in uh, 1915. And Elmer Sperry, um, who many of you may be aware of uh, from a navigational instruments perspective, coined the term, term automotive, things that move, and then started to bring together the broader community in developing standards for the aerospace community. Uh, next slide. And he thought so highly of what SAE were trying to do, Orville penned uh, uh, an open letter to um, his community to show the value of why they needed to engage. Um, as you can see, it uh, was, was penned in, in 1918, uh, just before the First World War, just as aerospace uh, and air vehicles were taking a more formative shape and more clearly into the uh, being used in the community. Next slide. So what was the first standard that the, that the new joint group developed and actually the humble spark plug um, was developed in uh, january of 1917 um it wasn't just uh, a local uh, national effort it was actually international um bringing together aviation pioneers and practitioners from uh, here clearly in the us but also from uh, great britain and france fundamental to this we continue today to reach out across the world to the global aviation community to bring people together to develop similar solutions and move technology forward. Next slide. So this is just a snapshot of the aerospace program under the Aerospace Council. Um, there's over 180 committees now, um, 10 broad groupings of those committees um, developing uh, nominally four types of aerospace standard from aerospace standard AS to material specifications, to best practices, to information reports. And not only does it form the, the, the basis of you know, standardized processes, standardized um, parts and components and, and subsystems, but it also provides a body of work from which others can learn and feeds the community in understanding where we are and where we clearly need to go to. Next slide. So from a metrics perspective, 
Um, on average, uh, but specifically last year, we had 125 meetings worldwide. They're basically in person meetings, which is significantly down from the many hundreds of meetings we typically have um, in, in, in normal operating times. COVID has clearly had a significant impact. So, although in person meetings were down, virtual meetings were up um, to over 3,000 in, in 2021. Um, that engaged over 8,000 individuals supporting those committees, um, which generated 85 brand new standards, not revisions, brand new standards. Um, there's actually more than, there's over 8,000 um, standards, active standards now in the marketplace. Um, with publish, publish, publications in 2021, was was nearly 700 688 standards were uh, published last year um we've got over 1300 in in work as whip and on average standards take about 18 months to to develop next slide so what does that mean well first of all somebody has to have a need there has to be um, a project request somebody to generate the need for a standard which then stimulates uh, the community to come together to to bring the right expertise to the table to ensure that um, that stakeholder agrees with the standards that they're going to develop to produce that material and then um, it then goes to our governance body the, in this instance the aerospace council for oversight they ensure that um, the objectives and the processes have been followed for that standard and then it's public it's it's published and um, placed uh in the in the electronic marketplace uh which i'll come to a little later next slide so where the standards fit how do what does it mean when we talk about standards um this graphic basically shows um the ecosystem for where standards come into and are consumed and referenced um, within the regulatory system. So you've got ICAO at the top, they uh, arbitrate and set standards for international um, flights. Um, then they provide conditions by which each state um, for us, that boils down to the key states of design, or obviously for the US, it's the FAA. Uh, for Europe, it's EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency. For Canada, it's Transport Canada. And for Brazil, that's, a that's ANAC. And those organizations effectively produce uh, probably at 90%, if not more, of the world's uh, commercial aviation products. And those organizations set re national regulations and identify means of compliance and the policies for implementing those requirements. And effectively standards provide an industry consensus of how we comply with those uh, regulations, either directly referenced within uh, ACs or acceptable means of compliance and policy, or in some instances, we actually provide input into um, the highest level uh, recommended practices defined by ICAO. Next slide. So, who are the council? At the moment, I think there's 33 organizations representing uh, government, industry, research organizations, academia, um, and obviously ICAO. Uh, they're an important part in providing oversight and transparency of how uh, we engage, how we provide uh, means of compliance and information um, for the regulatory system. Um, it's, a, it's a broad balance of representation from North America, from a small section from South America representing uh, Brazil, uh, for, uh, strong representation from Europe and, and, and Asia. Next slide.
so within um this slide really provides an overview and it, uh, it it's a strong uh summary of the breadth and depth of our current standards program and in essence the the material in blue does represent um the committees that have been formed between 2014 and, and 2021 in red at the bottom in fact in the last three months um we've added four new programs um two steering groups and and two committees um, the supersonic aircraft steering committee and the sustainable alternative fuels steering committee the two steering groups um, representing uh, supersonic and hypersonic vehicles and developing and understanding the ecosystem for developing a, a new range of products um, most of them are focused initially on general aviation, um, large business jets and small regional jets. And um, the sustainable alternative fuels group is looking at um, alternate fuel, alternate fuel sources to um, jet A uh, kerosene, uh, whether that be method by which it's manufactured, so bio sources. Uh, alternate chemical compositions, um, also hydrogen. So it's a it's a, a growing area with a significant group of stakeholders coming together to um, identify what the landscape currently is and where we need to go to make a, a greener economy and support aviation in that economy. Um, specifically from a committee perspective, we've got S18H, Human consideration for safety assessment. Um, this is uh, a committee formed out of legislation from the US Congress to do with the uh, 737 MAX, um, basically trying to integrate human, human performance or human factors into the design and safety assessment process. Uh, again, a very active group that's uh, formed uh, over the last couple of months. And then finally, uh, G36, sustainable waste management. Um, this is rather a departure from the typical uh, technical uh, technical program. This is actually starting to look at the waste. We, initially, the waste we generate in international flight, all the food, um, the waste products that uh, would normally either go into a landfill or be incinerated. Uh, when you land in a, in a foreign country, and uh, we're now looking to look at how we can better recycle more of that waste, single use items being the first. And it's not just on the aircraft, it's also in the airport and how we consume those things in the first instance within the flight kitchen, how they're packaged, how they're then transferred to the aircraft and how they're, that waste is then um, recycled and reused. And as you can see, those with stars are committees or taskings that have been generated um, either by an authority, another agency or a specific trade association to resolve uh, an issue that they have. Uh, next slide. So closer to home um, from what's aerospace's involvement with, within Ohio. And currently, there's just over 1300 uh, participants uh, from Ohio um, with 598 unique participants uh, of those uh, across those uh, 12, sorry, across the committees that, uh, that those members are engaged in. It typically goes up and down as um, participants uh, change their roles. Um, currently, there are 12 uh, members who chair committees directly, uh, five as vice chair and four as secretary. Um, the uh, roles of chair and vice chair are held uh, on a two year cycle. Um, so a, a chair can hold that position for about six years, three, two cycles, um, two, two elections. Um, so those numbers do go up and down. But that's a significant contribution given the scope of those organizations that uh, participate. Currently, uh, GE Aviation is a sitting council member. So 
also help guide um, the program that we currently have. Next slide. And where do they engage? These are just some of the, these are the major committees where we can clearly identify um, individuals or individual from organizations from Ohio engage. Obviously, you can see additive manufacturing is a key area, um, but that goes across uh, many materials and engine wheels and brakes, um, very propulsion centric with GE. Um, that's very strong engagement on some very active committees. Next slide, please. And who are they? It's a, a good broad cross section of industry uh, authorities from, um, should I say, government with AFRL, uh, from NASA. Um, obviously, you got to University of Cincinnati um, playing a strong role, but obviously key. Uh, suppliers uh, and manufacturers to major airframers and obviously with with uh, raking technologies now being one of the one of the largest um, prime uh, suppliers it gives a, a, a real basis of strength and depth um, across Ohio next slide please so what does that what do the standards look like? Obviously, uh, as I explained, you've got uh, aviation standards, there's best practices, there's information reports, um, but that's just the more formal aspects that the committee's uh, process develop. There's also uh, edge reports um, summarizing opinions of research and technology. There's books, we hold um, digital events, we hold Aerotech, which is an in-person event. Um, there's a broad range of, of tools and uh, STEM events uh, going from uh, K through 12 and collegiate programs. There's also a professional development activity as well, all formed around the standards that uh, these committees produce. And they're all available through um, a couple of tools, one being Mobilis and the other being on Qeu, um, digital environment tools to be able to search and um, purchase our standards, but then effectively also consume them electronically. So linking them to design tools um, and making them more available in, in, in a format that you need to use them. So next slide. So, as I said in my introduction, um, we're looking at the, the, the totality of, mo uh, of, of mobility, the multimodal way we, we now uh, move around and uh, interact, not just from an aviation perspective, but how that links uh, with the ground segment as well. The transition to uh, advanced air mobility and the use of uh, unmanned vehicles. Is, is, is changing that dynamic and bringing together a lot of different areas that perhaps were, were traditionally segregated. You know, propulsion, electric propulsion systems, which is bringing advanced changes in, in, in the advancement of the wiring systems, the use of batteries, the use of autonomy, um, making sure that the new materials that these air vehicles are constructed from are appropriately crash worthy, uh, making sure the fact of because we're more data rich and there's more software involved that cybersecurity is a consideration. It's bringing these different technologies into a more integrated and related fabric. And it's that awareness that is um, bringing together programs like this, but making sure that SAE itself works with our ground vehicle teams to make sure that the standards are appropriate for, for both those key domains as core technologies. The latest actually is a, is a cyber physical standard, which was a, a joint ground and, and, and air, air sector committee. Uh, that's just been published. Uh, the work that we're doing with autonomy links, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence together to um, enrich and improve um, the solutions we're using with you know, 
automation and obviously the cross-linked mobility with uh, air traffic services, which are going to change for this new urban environment. Next slide, please. So I mentioned um, advanced materials and additive manufacturing. This slide's a little old, but effectively um, up, to, up to now we've published, it says over 25, I got an update just before the call saying there's now 31 uh, published standards being produced across both uh, materials handling, metals, non-metallics. Um, as you can see, there's over 500 individuals engaging across a very broad ecosystem from 24 countries in a very engaged program and bill and dave and p doty will go into more detail of how how we how we bring the community together in different methods to advance the work in uh, advanced manufacturing techniques next slide And this just shows uh, the further detail of the more recent uh, documents, but I know Bill Billman is going to go into a lot more detail. So next slide. And why are we here? Apart from to share um, how we engage in standards development, um, show what's relevant to your community. It's also a request to get engaged. Standards aren't written on their own. SAE International doesn't write those standards. We provide an environment to bring you together to engage in a broader community and form partnerships and produce work that individual organizations can't produce on their own. You know, SAE to some extent is a sum of its parts and those parts are very desperate and there are many of them. But by doing that in the way we do, we really, produce uh, solutions to problems that industry has in a more general sense. But thank you, I appreciate your time and over to you, Becky. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that great overview of the Aero Standards Program. Jonathan's contact details are here if anyone has questions for him or feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we'll get to those later on in the presentation. So our next speaker is Mr. Bill Billman, the founder of Aerolytics. Bill is going to talk about the Aerospace Material Standards Additive Manufacturing Committee overview. So welcome, Bill. Thank you, Becky. Uh, good morning. I appreciate this opportunity to, to speak to you all. I've been engaged uh, with SAE in terms of additive manufacturing informally for the last, I don't know, probably five, five or six years, but more formally as a a contractor that liaises between the technical committees and uh, leadership uh, to provide a little insight and, and strategic mapping and, and some bandwidth. But uh, really, we have a, a few of the experts on the phone. We're, we're fortunate to have uh, Dave Abbott and Paul Jonas to talk about their respective sections, but I'm gonna provide an overview about uh, what we do and then a little bit more details about the metals committee. So Becky, next slide, please. So you'll see some of these slides as repetitive, I think just to reinforce the, the, the message here, and I won't dwell on this since Jonathan had already covered this, but effectively this vision 2030 covers these 10 strategic areas. And, and in particular, and we're kind of proud to say towards the top of the list, we've got advanced manufacturing, advanced materials of which additive manufacturing or 3D printing, uh, is is a part of that. I wish we could have more interaction. Uh, of course, these uh, presentations without a live audience uh, seem to be more monologues and, and not a dialogue, but I would be very curious how many people on the line understand what 3D printing is or additive manufacturing, essentially one and the same. Uh, but I'll assume that you all have at least some knowledge of that, and we'll talk about that in more detail. So this is the, the mission, vision, and and the method, and Jonathan talked about this in more detail. Next slide, please. So basically, uh, SAE, we've, Jonathan talked about this, but from slightly different angle, we've talked about how we've worked in aerospace standards for over a century, the number of documents that are presented, 
in the range uh, from ARP, the recommended practice, to something that's a little bit more specific, and that's what I'll talk about uh, in more detail, but AMS, which are aerospace material specifications, and the first publication was in 1939 that addressed aerospace aluminum. Uh, why? Well, because the chemistry varied from company to company, and, and some of the techniques, for example, we roll plate, we need standards for those. Uh, without that, you can't predict quality of the material, and without that, you've got large variations in, in the design. So we needed to, to remove some of that ambiguity, narrow that design envelope, and so this is uh, one of the products here. So basically, the, the interesting thing about the committee, and this is true regardless of materials, uh, that they're, they're industry-led or actuated by SAE, but SAE doesn't really do the authoring of these documents, and they're highly diversified. Um, basically, if you look at the bumper towards the bottom, it's, it's consensus-based standards really help facilitate the adoption of aerospace materials and drive costs down, increase, or maintain quality is the, uh, the ultimate objective. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit more uh, onerous, uh, but this is why we're doing what we're doing. So essentially, in order to build an aircraft, you need to understand the margin between what your design objective is, uh, what you anticipate the load will be in the field, and have uh, an adequate margin of safety. And in order to do that, you need to build up from a, a base of the, the material properties. And so if anybody out there is familiar with CAD, uh, these are the material cards that you would input the basic property. We call them the bulk material characterizations. And that's what we help feed. So essentially what you're looking at is a pyramid that talks about two alternatives for the qualification or the certification of an article. One is point design, which is where you design something and you test that specific configuration. But if you make any changes, uh, you'll have to re retest in, in many cases. So there's an alternative path, which is called the building block approach. And this is the building block approach where you start at the bottom with these, these coupons, and then you build up a more sophisticated design that's more specific to your final final design. And there's regulations. This is CFR's Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, they talk about the process of what needs to be tested and to what extent. So this is what the OEMs, the, the manufacturers go through to substantiate their parts. And we start at the basis there with uh, what we refer to as, as the X's, either general aviation, commercial aviation, helicopter. In, in the case of business general aviation, BGA, it's 23. Uh, air transport's 25, uh, rotary ring is either 27, 29, et cetera. They have specificity here, and our research feeds these, uh, these lower levels of that building block. We need to control the material, uh, 23, for example, 603, we need to control the process, 23, 605, and then we need to characterize the, the material in terms of those test samples, let's say in this case, 23, 613. So as we develop these allowables, uh, we'll develop both material and process specs, and that will feed, in, in some cases, public handbooks. If it's metals, and I'm focusing on metals, uh, Paul Jonas will follow and talk in more detail about non-metals, ostensibly polymers, but the, the main handbook for metals is MNPDS, and they talk about the bulk material characterization. Yeah, they have an, uh, a new volume that's looking at additive manufacturing. And then its counterpart in the, the non-metals world, the polymers world, is CMH-17. Uh, both are former military handbooks. In the case of MMPDS, it's uh, former Mill Handbook 5. And of course, CMH-17, it's former Mill Handbook 17. Um, so basically, what, what do we do? We help streamline this process of creating these these detailed uh, material characterizations at the bottom that eventually lead towards the top uh, to full characterization of, of whatever the artifact is. So I know uh, a lot of detail here, and if you see this for the first time, it's a little dizzy, uh, but the point is we play a very, very important role uh, to help understand and demystify this process of material characterization that becomes an essential step towards the, the full qualification of an artifact. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what's the timeline? Uh, the, the group was formally stood up in 2015 per a tasking letter from the FAA, but there was some initial work that predates that, that, that goes back to 2002. And it was a derivative of a titanium spec that talked about how to weld titanium and stack and stack metal. Uh, it wasn't known as 3D printing at the time. It wasn't until 20, 2009. Uh, our counterpart, ASTM F42, helped coin that term. Well, it wasn't coined. It was just officially agreed to. Uh, and we work closely with, with them and other partners about developing standards and, and frameworks. So uh, we started in 2015. Dave Abbott is fortunate. <laughs> to, to, we're fortunate to have him on the the call, he was part of this, this founding effort, this founding team. And what they did basically is started to develop a series of documents. So in 2018, oh, in 2018, uh, we issued the first framework for, for metals. It was the first standard, uh, followed shortly thereafter by the first non-metals. Uh, again, Paul Jonas will talk about that. It was the Ultim 9085 project. It's a thermal plastic that's being extruded. And then uh, shortly thereafter, uh, we set up, and Pete Doty will talk about this in more detail, but the AMDC. And the AMDC, because aerospace is empirical, we need data. And the AMDC is is focused on generating, in this case, it's called S-based allowables, but generating actual data to show that we could perfect um, uh, the production of, of metals to be used, and eventually perhaps uh, non-metals in this consortium, uh, but to be used in, in aerospace. And then to date, we have these 31 published documents, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Jonathan uh, touched on this briefly. Thank you. Next slide. So how are we structured? So basically, I mentioned the metals effort and also non-metals. I haven't talked about repair. David Abbott has kind of moved on from being chair of the overall committee over to, to repairs and is uh, building out that, that effort. But basically, we have at the top, our, our chairperson is Hector Sandoval, who's a fellow at Lockheed Martin. Uh, the vice chair is, is an individual uh, from Boeing. And then the secretary actually was somebody from the FAA who's, who since rotated, rotated out. Uh, but you could see metals, non-metals, and, and repairs. And basically, we have representation from key organizations. This is just a snapshot, but it's to show you that the people who are involved in, in setting the direction of the people who are highly responsible for the, the quality of these parts that are generated. Uh, so it's, it's in their best interest to be engaged, and we're fortunate to have them. So uh, good representation across the, the, the value chain. And the next slide. We'll talk about uh, how we break down organization. So effectively, the slide that comes up uh, next, we'll talk about the membership. There are over 650 members, and this is how it breaks out. I think it's an excellent representation that no particular type of organization is dominant. So we have material providers, aerospace OEMs, which includes commercial aerospace, Blue Origin, for example. We have machine I wouldn't call them OEMs necessarily, but let's call them machine builders. Uh, the EOSs, the concept lasers, now uh, part of GE Additive, uh, SLM that are involved. And then very, very importantly, the, the, the people who are in the middle of these organizations, the tier twos, the tier threes, the, the spirits, the GKNs of the world, uh, as well as others. So it's, it's highly diversified. There are over 220 different organizations from 28 different sectors here. And then we meet biannually. Uh, we've been stymied basically because of COVID. As Jonathan talked about, there's been an increase in, in virtual meetings. Uh, we, there's talk about having a fall meeting now in, in Europe, which is refreshing. Uh, but typically we meet in the, the spring and the fall in either the North America uh, and Europe, depending on the the time of year and we alternate back and forth. Uh, we've just been kind of pushed into a virtual space as of late, but uh, plan to resume shortly. Uh, next slide. You've seen this before. This is updated of, of what Jonathan had, so I, I won't belabor this, but over 31 documents, uh, which is substantial because as Jonathan talked about, the average time it takes to release a standard is about a year and a half. So there's a fair amount of work, really that cadence 
is a function of the energy, <laughs> the insight, the enthusiasm, if you will, of this of the sponsor. Uh, the sponsor is kind of the the orchestra, orchestra conductor in a sense. Uh, a preponderance of these documents are metals, uh, twenty six, and uh, then a few uh, uh, non metals, and we're we're going to grow that uh, as we move into more sophisticated materials. And uh, we have a whole bunch, uh, over 20 work in progress. We talked about the membership and uh, you saw this slide before in terms of the number of countries, but great, uh, great diversity, good representation. Next slide, please. Okay, Jonathan also showed this slide as well. So I won't, I won't go into detail, but what's an important takeaway is uh, predominantly we look at material and process. And so what does that mean? Remember that slide we we talked about earlier, the, the design pyramid, that all presupposes that you have a fixed process. So anybody who studied quality and, and understands the philosophy at the Edwards Demings, you can't have a lot of variation in the system. And in order to control that process, process there's, there's a recipe, which includes not only the process, but the material and overlaying that is the process control document. So we've been focused on that uh, in, in the case of, of metals as we've started, but also polymers, uh, we started off with a template that I'll talk about in more detail that looks at what, what we refer to as casually now as ink and L, uh, but it's been gener become generic over the years, but ink and L625, which is a nickel-based super alloy. Um, so we look at how to build these parts, uh, what the specificity is for the powder, and then we, we lock down that, that process. But there's a little bit more nuance in that, how there's could be some variation in process depending on intellectual property. I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail, uh, but we also have covered polymers. I mentioned this, it's the Ultim 9085. It's a Stratasys project uh, that was jointly sponsored by the, the FAA and uh, Wichita State University was involved and, and Paul, Paul will talk about this in more detail. And then increasingly we're moving in, in another direction, not just upstream where material and process is, is trying to control that and perfect that, if you will, because that's what's demanded of by, F, uh, by not only the FAA, just aerospace in general, including EASA, but looking increasingly downstream and more about the certification of the artifact and controlling the quality throughout the value chain. So these are some other sample uh, documents as we, we release or on the verge of releasing a machine qualification. Uh, so what constitutes a major change if you recalibrate the laser or there's a power outage or you move, move the machine? We need to understand this uh, as an industry so we can uh, drive towards uh, better quality, more consistent quality with additive manufacturing. Next slide, please. So this is a shopping list of, of uh, specs. So what's interesting is a lot of this focuses on powder. And so if you look at this, of these 17 documents, only one is non-powder, it's, it's wire. Uh, it happens to be TI-64. Why powder? Because the morphology of the powder is very important. Not only the chemistry, but you have reactive metals like titanium and aluminum that pick up oxygen. And uh, their characterization can change during the manufacturing process. Uh, or the handling process. So it's really, really important to understand the powder, how the powder is distributed in terms of the particle size. These are small. So typical powders in aerospace are on the order of 40, 50 micron. A human hair is about 80 microns, so about half the thickness of a human hair. So pretty, pretty phenomenal to work with this material and it can, can be potentially dangerous as well. So there's, there's environmental hazard, uh, but we've spent a lot of energy trying to characterize these, these powders. Uh, if you look at the lower right, you can see how it, it segments in terms of super alloy, usually nickel based, but sometimes there's cobalt super alloys. Titanium uh, is an important in market for us or, or commodity that we use, steel as, as well as aluminum. Increasingly, we're, we're seeing more work in, in the aluminum space as well as some uh, non traditional alloys. Next slide. So I won't go into detail because. Uh, Paul will talk about this, but essentially uh, the nonmetals group is started down the path of fused filament fabrication. And uh, as I mentioned, using that Stratasys, the Altum material system, uh, it's also focused on material and, and process, but also provides a little bit more specificity. There's an interesting framework that they've developed that metals is starting to adopt 
which is called slash sheets. Paul might talk about that. Uh, but essentially what we're looking at now as we become more sophisticated and trying to move towards uh, actual strength uh, and, and structural requirements for non-metals is including continuous fiber, for example. Uh, these are pretty profound systems. I think Mark Forge is, is sponsoring a document in, in that domain. A third area in development is looking at laser centering of, of polymer powders. And then uh, just a quick overview of, of their work is they've got 11 works in progress, which includes one revision. And uh, it's a very interesting discussion. I don't know if Paul is gonna get into this, but their use of slash sheets, which is kind of the best of both worlds where you can have a general framework, but then underneath that, you can have specificity that talks about if you want this material characterization and you go through, we're gonna give you the recipe to get there. Uh, and that's pretty profound, especially for some of the smaller companies to say exactly uh, what machine to use, what are the, the, the parameter settings to use, what material to use, and how to control to, to get some type of uh, initial part. Uh, so you look at that consistency. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is uh, <laughs> more detail about the, the, uh, uh, the framework that we use and, and we'll provide this, this slide deck so I won't belabor this because for some that are seeing this for the first time can be uh, a little, uh, if, especially if you don't have the engineering background necessarily, but basically it talks about the hierarchy of how that detail is provided, the statement of work or the, the purchase order uh, or the, the drawing will be called out uh, and it calls out this framework. So at the, the highest level, you've, you've got the part itself, 7,000. This happens to be that nickel alloy that we talked about. This is the framework that we use. It calls out the process. How do you freeze that, that process using a certain amount of discretion, but helping to minimize that variation. Then it also talks about what powder tier you, that you use. In that powder, in this case, AMS 7001, it includes the morphology. It includes control about the chemistry. Uh, which is very, very important. And as a consequence of that, it also reaches into the, the powder processing spec. All that feeds into uh, the process control document. And that process control document is, is that specific formula that helps fix the process, uh, including uh, subsequent post-processing, which can change the, the crystallography and, and the mechanical properties. So all this needs to be controlled and accounted for when you build aerospace parts. Uh, next slide, please. So Pete Doty, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail, but basically back in 2000, we stood up an organization that says, because of the empiricism required by aerospace, we're gonna actually build these data, that lower building block. That's what I spent so much time on that particular side because that becomes the basis for all the work that we do. So basically what we've done is Upstream, we're creating this consensus standards. Downstream, we're creating the, the data now, and those feed each other. It's a symbiotic relationship. I won't go into detail because Pete will talk about this, but I mentioned S basis. If he's interested, he could share more details about that, but it really has to do with that the, the, the confidence that we have in that distribution of the data and the assumptions that we can make as design engineers. Uh, but basically, they're gonna create this repository for design data. And uh, it's a highly collaborative effort that build, test, and analyze these data to uh, for submittal, for example, in MMPDS. Next slide, please. And these are some members. Uh, there are a couple members that that uh, their names were withheld uh, based on, on uh, sensitivities, but uh, it's well representative of the of the. Uh, supply chain here. And I'm looking for. Well, we have GE in the lower left. I'm looking for some Ohio companies. Uh, but uh, I think GE is the only one, GE Aviation. And it focuses this, what I've referred to generically or the industry, Inconel, Inconel 718, which is uh, similar to 625 high nickel based alloy. Uh, so it's super alloy used uh, extensively in the gas turbine. Next slide, please. And then uh, just touching on PRI as we wrap up. So PRI, excuse me, PRI, uh, PRI, is the one that manages the NADCAP accreditation program. And uh, NADCAP is really, really important because it provides checklists, it provides universality of, of quality across manufacturing systems. Uh, so the accreditation is, is utilized by most OEMs, again, or our manufacturers, uh, and it includes oversight for special processes. 
And then what they've done within the last couple of years is, is stood up this within the welding tasking group and added a manufacturing group. Actually, it's been a decade now. Uh, they're developing criteria eventually that you can audit against. So you can kind of uh, discretize the, the work steps of, of added manufacturing 3D printing, and you can check against that. And that helps control quality. Uh, they started with powder bed fusion. Why powder bed fusion? Well, because it's the most popular. And uh, they looked at it, and then it's been re released now within the last few years. Uh, basically, there's a small number of suppliers, relatively speaking, given the global industry for aerospace in terms of manufacturing. Uh, the adoption's relatively slow because it's kind of a, a chicken and an egg scenario about how do you how do you industrialize the process of additive manufacturing? And that is exactly exactly what standards try to do. It tries to drive costs down, maintain quality, and help industrialize that. As we get up, let's say we're low TRL four and five to the the seven eight nine. So uh, this becomes yet another tool in the toolkit. So I think that's the last slide. Nope. Okay, so we're uh, these are just meetings. Um, we might be in uh, EOS uh, in the fall, uh, either down in Texas or in Germany. I think it's going to be down in Texas, um, but we're trying to get back on track. So uh, if you have any questions, if you look at the next slide, Becky, I'll, I'll put Jeff out there. So he's the committee manager. Uh, you can also contact me. I'm sure you could come across my contact information if you have any specific questions. I think we have time later for Q and A, uh, but either Jeff or I will take uh, good care of you. And if we don't have the answer, we'll put you in touch with somebody who does. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And as Bill said, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box, and we will be answering questions towards the end of today's webinar. So, thanks again, Bill. And we'll move on now to Paul Jonas, the Vice Chair Technical Director, Wichita State University Firepoint Innovation Center. Paul's going to speak about the SEAMS Additive Manufacturing Non-Metallic Committee. So welcome, Paul. Good morning. Um, how is everybody today? Um, and welcome to the uh, webinar. Yeah, my name is Paul Jonas, uh, vice chair currently of the um, non-metallic committee. Uh, I, I was the uh, founder and original chair of the committee when we started, uh, but since then uh, we've moved on to Kurt Davis, who's now the chair. I've assumed the role of vice chair. Uh, Kurt's out today with a uh, medical procedure that he couldn't move today. So we wish him well off of that. Um, currently in the role of uh, technical director at Wichita State Firepoint. Uh, I think a lot of people remember Wichita State as being uh, from the National Institute for Aviation Research, uh, which I was a director for 10 years. Uh, prior to that, uh, chief engineer at uh, aircraft OEM. Uh, so I have a little bit of background in aircraft design and certification. And really the only difference between Firepoint and NIR is that uh, we focus uh, primarily on military work um, as we have a research partnership with the Army in place. So going through this, uh, some of the first charts may be redundant. I'm going to spend a little bit more time kind of getting into the details of some of the challenges that we have in generating specifications, as Bill did with, uh, talked, alluded to with, how do we use these specifications for certification? Uh, next chart, please. <clears throat> So again, I, I think we're all kind of had everybody's charts again. I really don't want to spend a whole lot of time uh, on this, but um, like I said, the first additive manufacturing spec in 2002, and then we formed the uh, non-metallics uh, later. Next chart, please. <clears throat> I'll walk by these pretty fast. Um, again, um, what we said, the polymer group is initially called polymer uh, additive manufacturing. But we expanded that name to non-metallics because I think that's more encompassing. As Bill alluded to, there's uh, quite a few technologies. We're now being able to uh, continuous fibers or uh, polymer uh, basis, and so it could be thermal sets, thermal plastics, <clears throat> um, uh, just different processes altogether. So we wanted to be more inclusive. As a matter of fact, we can print cores. 
Um, and of course, then we um, issued our first standard in 2019. Um, next chart, please. Um, one of the things that I, I, I think, again, is just a, a bill and um, talked about earlier off the thing was um, the makeup of the committee works is very broad, uh, international, and all walks of life. I mean, we talk about aerospace, but again, I think it's uh, uh, quite diverse, which, I, which I'm very pleased of. Of course, the, the non-metallic committee, uh, a little bit smaller when we get into those actually who have the expertise that believe that they can vote on the specifications. But again, I think this would be a, a, my chance to uh, put out an open invitation to anybody who really wants to become involved in SAE and can bring some expertise to the table. We'd love to have new members all the time. Uh, next chart, please. <clears throat> so just a little bit of our organization. I know we're, we're slightly different than the metallic side in our specifications. Again, we look at the process from uh, material spec and a process spec, and those two together are paired, actually. So, you, so your materials with the process produces the material itself. And so the first two specifications that we did were with the um, Ultem 9085 materials. Again, there's the specification on which you would procure the material to, would give the requirements of the material as you buy it, and then also the process specifications. And now if I look at the baseline specifications, they're at a high level. They talk about the fuse filament fabrication process and what I would get for, for instance, what that uh, uh, wire would look like and as far as what the process spec. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the use of a slash sheet. A slash sheet, if you think of this, is I want to be very detailed. So I'm going to say rather than a fuse filament fabrication process, I'm going to say I want Ultim 9085, which is a specific material, and then I'm going to process that on a, as an example, a Stratus Fortis 900 machine. And those two together, when you work with that, we can create a process or a material data set where I do have um, material properties and design allowables generated that could be referenced if you use those. Um, and of course, then we just see that we're working on some different materials. One of, one of the beauties about this is, is I can start with the baseline material, and there could be, like I said, I showed down here is a slash two. There could be another material come along. It could be a, my, my, maybe a totally different chemical composition, or maybe someone trying to make an equivalent product to the uh, Stratasys ultimate material. Or on the other side, there could be another slash sheet. It could be a different machine that we use, maybe qualifying to the same material or a different material off the side. So what the structure does is it allows us to be very general in the high level processes, but also start putting together some uh, specific data sheets or individual material machine combinations. I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go uh, further. And of course, then the specification structure can expand as we said, as Mark um, built it earlier, which is we can probably do like a, a Mark Forge type of a process or maybe there's a stereolithography, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, then we just create different structures for the different processes. One other thing about the additive uh, committees we have from SAE is that there are some support groups. We have some general, we have some data requirements um, that we do share amongst us. And of course, Dave Abbott's gonna talk uh, later on this afternoon about a repair. Repair is both metallic and non-metallics uh, as, as we go. So I, again, this is kind of the overview of the high level specifications that we have in the non-metallic organization. Next chart. So some of the, the work we did, we talked about the current standards have been released, our, our predecessors, which are really the uh, Ultem 985 materials. Um, since then, we validated the slash sheets for the uh, fuse filament fabrication. Uh, they have been validated. Uh, and, and honestly, I don't know. They should be. They went to Aerospace Council, so they actually may be very, very close to being published at this time. Um, we do have some others that were in their initial balloting. Um, again, we talked about uh, uh, high-performance laser synthering. So this is a powdered form of the, of the non-metallic materials, which you can synther like a process, and of course, the materials for that as well. So those are out in ballot and, and currently being worked on as we um, move those specifications from concept uh, to a formal document. Next chart, please. 
Oh, and I think we talked a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to read the chart here, but um, there's there's a lot of work that's being go, going in place because again, we talked about the uh, Mark Forge. We talked about some continuous fiber uh, materials that are being looked at, uh, and we're trying to lay out the the general framework and the scope for the specifications. Um, and just kind of moving on, we do have some other um, uh, support documents as Bill did as, as well, like how do you specify machine requirements? Maybe there are some uh, requirements for recycling as well. Next chart, please. And like I said, we, we do provide additional documents, guidance materials. Again, um, how do you, what's going to be required if I'm going to generate data for my specifications? Um, polymer qualification guidelines, and maybe some recycling, as I said earlier, or powder uh, material reuse. Next charts. <clears throat> so, um, so a lot of that I know is kind of maybe a little bit redundant, but but I really wanted to kind of focus today on the spec development itself. And so when we have a uh, in the additive manufacturing world. Um, uh, one of the things we have is we you have the machine. The machine has to have its current setup, what it's modded, what it's make. Uh, and in our software, obviously, there's a lot of different variations and, and uh, uh, versions of software. And then we put that with the material. And of course, all that together with our design and our layering information provides a part. And as we spoke of before, the very detailed information of that is usually documented in what we call a process control document, the PCD. And, and what everybody's been trying to do here a little bit is to put the balance between how much of that information is company and how much of that is going to be public and shared information. Um, but again, you kind of look at it from, is this a unique process where I'm going, uh, trying to support more of a commodity process at this point in time? Next chart. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk a little bit about a slash sheet. And again, when I talked about a slash sheet is the idea that um, we have a material that was what was enough use, a much co uh, common background that people have chosen to freeze that PCD, make it public, and then go ahead and test the, the data, uh, uh, the number of coupons that we can provide so we'll have material process properties and design levels. A little bit of background on this one. Um, before I get into the chart, Bill talked about this, but uh, kind of a precursor to that, we worked with the FAA and, and basic on the basic question of can additive manufacturing, can we put out a specification and a material spec, put it on a machine, run some material, test it, and then take those exact same documents and send them to another machine half, halfway across the country have them set up and they could produce identical material. And when I say identical material, I'm, I'm saying statistically equivalent when we do it. So the variation in, in the material properties is going to be statistically the same. And so that was when it started and, and actually Nair was put together and, and they wanted, uh, was funded by the FAA to go put together a process under NCAMP. And I don't know if you know the world on, on uh, NCAMP, but it came out of composites. But basically, it's a process for testing non-metallic materials that allows, uh, um, you know, test environment, allow some shared databases with this. Um, so the um, so the first thing we had was the Ultim 9085 material. Now, Ultim, I don't know if you know this, it has been um, <clears throat> uh, widely used. I mean, it's been used in aviation. Uh, interiors in the cabins, mostly in the stuff you can't see, but in ductworks, ductworks and brackets and things of that nature. And the material is, is is famous because it meets the flame and you know smoke toxicity requirements. So it's been very popular. So when we started this, there was probably well over 10,000 uh, part numbers flying on commercial airliners that were made of Ultim 985. And of course, with the Stratasys, they were able to print that material. And I think in the picture that Bill had on his part, you can see it's used for duct works. And because with additive, you can print uh, uh, features and shapes that really you would be very, very cost prohibitive to go lay them up by hand. <clears throat> so that was the predecessor off of that. And so what happened was uh, we worked with um, 
it's an America Makes project with that. And, and so a little bit of history behind that was America Makes started with Ultim 9085 and they uh, went out to all their members that had uh, Fortis 900 machines and they said, print us coupons. And then they brought the coupons and then they tested the coupons. And, and what they got off the thing is they had some material data, but their coefficient of variation was very high, 29. And I don't know if anybody who has worked with design allowables or the material properties, but that says your process is out of control. So it really focused and told us that we needed to have uh, uh, process specifications and material specifications that tightened up that process a little bit. Um, and, and I just want to make sure um, that people in the audience understand when I say material property and a design allowable. A material property, as Bill said, that's the bulk properties of the materials, your modulus, your density, and, and the other things. And you can come up with like an S basis, which is, a, a like I said, an average strength, although it uh, has some sort of statistic, can't be used for design. But if I'm going to design, I need a, a minimum design value. And what we do is we take our material properties and then we adjust those properties based upon the coefficient of variation, how, how much scatter I have in my data, to come up with, like I said, a design number of, to generate an actually design minimum, like an A or a B basis or something of that nature, that depend upon what you need in your, in your, in your uh, design. So with that, we have to be really focused on process ver verification. You know, how, where does this uh, variation come from and can I control it so that I have con consistent repeatable materials? <clears throat> so again, we talked about the PCD and of course it's how do you handle, how do you buy your peat stock, your print file, your printer, post-processing, mechanical testing. And then we have the specifications, material, process, and of course we talked about spec minimums. But what I really do with the slash sheets is we take one of those processes, like we did uh, on our project with the Ultima 9085, and we, in the slash sheet, then gives you the detailed information that should someone want to go replicate this, they would have those detailed parameters. Uh, what would be my machine settings? What would be, how would I have to buy my material? Uh, so I, I know what the properties are, the shape of it, its flow characteristics. The process spec, how would I have to set up my machine? What software version would I need to? Um, spec minimums, how would I build my coupons and test it? And all that's defined in the slash sheet. And what that does then is from a standards perspective, if you wanted to go buy into that specification, you would have to then use those slash sheets in your build. Now, is it for everybody? Maybe not. Maybe you, you know, wanna go and change a material and a setup for each part, which then in an aerospace world would put you into a point design certification. Or if you wanted to do something that uh, I wanted to build a family of parts to, and I didn't want to have to go back and, and regenerate the data every time, then I could use these specifications for that. So we've been moving off again. It just gives us a little ways that says, as we move from more of a generic approach to additive manufacturing, to a specific process where we might have a data set already generated, the slash sheet is a way that I document and control that. Um, I know that's a kind of a high level, and of course, uh, what I Bill brought up earlier was, is that the slash sheet could be used for metallic processes as well. Uh, at some point in time, you know, someone may uh, invest and do the full set of testing and of course that PCD or that inf process and material information would have to be documented and shared. Which also gets into the, the one of the biggest problems we see with slash sheets. Slash sheets require a lot of testing. In order to generate the data for, you know, a set of a B basis type allowable, you could easily be um, three to 5,000 coupons and it could be, you know, quite an investment in time. And so one of the things I think, uh, I think it comes up later today is a little bit about how SAE might put together a consortia so that we can start putting our, uh, our shared resources together, start generating some of that very specific data that we need. Again, it's just another way that SAE is trying to go fill the gap and ensure uh, uh, success in the future. I will say though, just kind of a, in a background note is that in my PowerPoint work, work with the military, um, I have worked with them and qualified, I think we have five Ultim 9085 parts that have been approved for flight. And one of the um, 
real important parts of that whole process was because there was an FAA approved material data set that had design allowables that just really a lot. And we did not have to do a lot of testing for variation of the parts, just what we needed to get the uh, structural uh, requirements intact. So again, that's a little bit of information where we're doing the non-metallic side. Um, I'll make myself available. I, you'll have my charts with my contact information if someone wants to get a hold of me later. So next chart, please. Uh, just a couple more charts looking forward. Again, uh, what's in the future? As we said, there's a lot of new machines, a lot of technologies, different materials, higher performance materials. Uh, we talked about maybe I can get different models of machines with the same serial system, uh, trying to get a different machine to make the same characteristics as the one I had. Next chart, please. And I said, um, again, continue being the leader in developing material process standards for aerospace. Um, Helping, helping repair, because I think, you know, part repair, not only the parts we're building, but some of the existing material uh, parts and systems we've out there fix. Uh, I talked about other materials and new, new, new uh, uh, processes out there. We certainly were looking for new partners and new members to, to help them along. And we said, as I finally facilitate the development of material data sets. It's this idea that uh, we're really going to come forward and take the, uh, you know, the power of additive. So we're going to have to make some of these uh, standard material uh, and design allowables available to the uh, designers and users. <clears throat> so with that, uh, next chart. I think I'm done. I said I was filling in for Kurt Davis Davies today, but you have my contact information if there's any uh, questions. I'm going to scan. The chat, I don't see any, but um, with that, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Paul, for that great overview and the, the detail that you provided. We do have contact information here. If anyone has questions for Paul, please type them into the chat box and we'll address those towards the end of today's webinar. And now we're going to move into a 10 minute break for everyone. So there's an automatic timer on your screen. We'll see everyone back in 10 minutes. Thanks.
Welcome back, everyone. Our next speaker is Pete Doty from the SEITC, and Pete is going to speak about the SAE AMS Additive Manufacturing Data Consortium. So welcome, Pete. Thank you, Becky, and uh, great to meet everybody virtually today. Um, we've already heard a number of things about the AMDC, as we call it, so I'll try to just hit the highlights and be prepared for any questions you have. Next slide. As a bit of a, a primer, though, wanted to highlight you know, what is SAITC. Um, most of you know SAE International, and most of the things that we've uh, spoken about today have been regarding SAE International. SAE Industry Technologies Consortia is an affiliate of SAE International, as is the Performance Review Institute PRI which you'll, you'll hear from Ethan shortly. Uh, we are um, organized in a slightly different manner uh, where SA International is a 501c3 uh, charity for uh, technology. Uh, we are a 501c6, technically a trade association. Again, regarding technology, we do not do lobbying. But the, the easiest way to describe the, the difference is where um, the members of SAE International Committees are um, individuals who are representing their own subject matter expertise uh, in relation to also their companies. In SAE ITC's consortia programs, the members are companies or other institutions such as the US government, a university, or a research institute. Next slide. SAE, um, sorry, one animation in there. Uh, SAITC has a number of consortia programs in the automotive and aerospace fields. Uh, they range, uh, some of them much older than SAITC itself, uh, and some quite new. Uh, some of our more widely known ones are uh, the Aerospace Engine Supplier Quality Strategy Group that Becky leads, uh, that uh, is a number of the aircraft engine manufacturers and, and how they manage their supplier systems, including your own uh, GE Aviation as, a, as one of the founding members there. Uh, we have Air Inc. Industry Activities, which manages the standards around uh, commercial aircraft avionics, and it's been around uh, for a number of decades, but uh, working in autonomous vehicle, uh, vulnerable user, road users, uh, safety, um, health ready components, which uh, has data coming off of uh, aircraft or ground vehicle components in order to predict their uh, maintenance and life cycles. So a lot of different things, but each of these is made up of companies that are working to Together, sometimes in a uh, pre-standard version where they build what we call a best practice uh, based on the input from that smaller number of companies and it may move on to become a, a standard at a later date. Um, and the goal is um, to be able to work a little bit more rapidly that you can, than you can in the open um, consensus standard forum of uh, SA International or a different SDO. Next slide. So as we have spoken about a lot today, the, um, the specifications for additive manufacturing, whether they be for metals or non-metals, have a lot of data that underlies those. Um, the, purpose of that is because many of these parts go into critical uses and whether uh, for the you know the company's sake um, they want to make sure that it's uh, reliable or safe or there's regulatory or certification requirements there needs to be the underlying data on that um, those are are built up and feed into the material specifications and can be further built in to fill into material handbooks for both metals and non-metals, such as MMPDS produced by the Battelle Institute or CMH17 for non-metals uh, uh, produced through uh, NIAR. Um, 
But in order to build the, these uh, all these data sets, you actually need to build some representative parts. Next slide. So what normally um, happens is that for particular materials, uh, you do test builds in a variety of axes. Uh, these are some representative um, builds for laser powder-based fusion uh, parts where you, you, know, you build cylinders in um, the vertical direction and then X and Y different directions you build um, essentially walls that'll get cut down into bars and that these are, will then be uh, machined into uh, test articles and sent to a mechanical testing lab that will go ahead and you know break them and determine the tensile strength of the material that you've you've built. Um, you need a number of these uh, these samples in order to build an appropriate data set, uh, usually requiring them to come from multiple machines. And you'd like to get multiple sources of uh, feedstock, which you know in in laser powder based fusion would be the the metal powder. Um, and you'd like to you know probably get it done at various locations so that you can start to include some some different variables to make sure that the data is representative of the wider effort. Well, this gets kind of expensive. It easily exceeds. $100,000 or more for many materials based on uh, the feedstock material cost. So the cost to make a new specification can be a bit costly. Um, and the members of the SAE AMS AM you know, Material Specifications Committee um, had figured that out that in order to keep working on all the materials that they would like to, including different variations of post-processing, such as heat treating or, uh, or HIP, they would uh, easily exceed you know, the budgets that uh, their companies had for this kind of research and development. But Rec thought about, well, what if we pooled all our resources and had the feedstock producers uh, put in their, their material those who have machines, time on theirs, heat treaters, time in the furnaces, mechanical testers do the breaking and then work together on the um, analysis of the data and thus share out the expenses and um, be able to produce more material specifications. And hence, AMDC was born. Next slide. So AMDC has brought uh, members from across the value chain, all those that I, I just met or mentioned, and they're you know, bringing their expertise and their material and their time on their machines in order for us to you know, um, build these data sets and um, feed that across into the material specifications. The added benefit is it starts to build a, a pool of data that the members can use, um, you know, share and use in order to do other analysis and uh, investigation that benefits their businesses. Um, this is also set up that uh, if a company has already done a, a project on its own and has some data on the shelf, that it may be able to bring that in and add that to the data um, that is being built and you know add to this this pool of data but also add to the data uh, that is used to support the specification and make sure it is even more relevant next slide so our, our near-term focus right now is solely to uh, to build the, that data um, in order to you know feed into those specifications as I mentioned earlier, if you move into a material handbook, uh, those are even are looking for even larger amounts of of data in order to be able to um, you know tighten up the the what the the material is going its its um, its ranges are going to be, um, but it can also uh, produce uh, additional data on other um, mechanical properties other than just the tensile strength 
and these can feed into the those design handbooks. Um, we are also since we have this data, you know, it allows us to do some additional work on best practices, on you know, data security, storage, uh, anonymization, and access in ways that um, individual companies can can share more broadly, but still protect those um, their you know, as we call it, their secret sauce, those those proprietary elements. Um, that they need to protect in order to have their commercial advantage, but that in some ways can be, you know, validated that they their special approaches uh, are producing the results in accordance with what the industry is expecting. So next slide. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, we can use the pre-existing data so that uh, projects that are already on the shelf, maybe there was a government project, maybe it was something that was internal to the company, and now they can have it uh, analyzed by peer experts to make sure that it was done you know, completely within uh, industry standards and specifications and can be added to this, this data pool um, and, and bring things forth, uh, as well as our efforts to uh, create you know, new data with the consortium acting like the uh, cond uh, cognizant uh, engineering organization. And next slide. Um, and we maintain through this time our relationship with the SAE committee, uh, routinely briefing back to them. But the idea is that you know these these underlying data sets now sponsor new specifications, continuing to grow um, the overall library of specifications, making it easier for design and manufacturing engineers to utilize additive manufacturing, especially in aerospace, but in other critical applications as well, and that in turn makes it easier you know for companies to use uh, this new tech or still you know emerging growing technology uh, and increase their businesses for, again from the feedstock producer all the way um, through the end end user next slide uh, as bill mentioned we started back in uh, um, december of 2020 uh, we, we have a number of organizations, including some good powerhouses uh, represented. Um, I'm, you know, because of their particulars, I'm also allowed to say that Blue Origin, you know, the space company is a member. I just can't display their logo. Um, but, you know, we've got GE Aviation, Moog, uh, Carpenter, um, Beehive may be a new uh, name to you, but that is a, a growing uh, 3D printing company going across. Uh, with a lot of expertise from the in industry. And we also have the benefit of the guidance of the Federal Aviation Administration who wants to make sure that this uh, can eventually feed into their certification efforts. And there's the Battelle Institute who manages the MMPDS um, material handbook, also making sure that our data uh, you know, sets are going to be constructed in the submission requirements that they all need. Uh, we're all open to more members and we're looking to you know continue our, our projects well, we've got a, uh, a nickel al uh, alloy project going right now and you know we want to be able to repeat these projects over and over and keep feeding into more specifications. So I think that's my last, last slide except for questions. Um, my apologies, I cut off my uh, contact info slide. So uh, please reach out through, through Becky or through the chat if you, you want to get in contact. We're also on, if you search uh, SAE and AMDC by Google, you'll find us on our website there as well. Thanks for the opportunity, Becky. Thank you very much, Pete, for that great review of the new data consortium on additive manufacturing. Again, if anyone has questions, pop them into the chat feature. We'll either answer them at the end of today's webinar or we'll get you an answer through email. 
So our next speaker is Mr. Dave Abbott, the Senior Staff Engineer at GE Aviation. And Dave is going to speak about the SAE AMS AM Repair Subcommittee and provide an overview of that committee's activities. So welcome, Dave. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Yes, my name is Dave Abbott, and I'm the chair of the SAE AMS uh, Repair Subcommittee. Next slide. As can be seen here, the repair subcommittee is the third major subcommittee uh, for SAE's AMS AM committee on additive standards for aerospace. Uh, our main charter is to develop and maintain aerospace material and process specifications for AM repair. We're a relatively new committee. We formed in the fall of 2019. So we haven't quite developed a separate materials and process uh, working groups like you see for the metals and, and non-metals working groups. Uh, once we do, once we have developed our, our framework, uh, which we're currently working on, then we'll go ahead and create the appropriate working groups under the uh, repair subcommittee. I guess for now, until we uh, create or establish that framework, I'll be working as a, a single group, and we'll be leveraging the relevant specifications from the uh, the metals and non-metals uh, subcommittees. And I can see us uh, continuing to leverage those metals and, and non-metal working groups, um, and add the, and we will either add. Uh, to the existing specifications or projects that they're working on, or we will tailor uh, whatever they're working on or whatever's in place specifically to additive repair as needed. Next slide. Okay, so as I said, we're a relatively new committee. Um, we we fought, uh, formed in the fall of 2019. I know that was in response to a um, survey that was put out by Amer uh, America makes their standardization roadmap for additive manufacturing. That was a collaboration uh, with ANSI. Um, they had formed the Additive Manufacturing Standardization Collaborative, and uh, this report was a result of that. And based on uh, one of the gaps that, that was identified for additive repair, we put together the uh, the committee. We currently have 70 members, but I would say that right now, 10 to 20 uh, people are, are very active. Uh, participants, um, we're, we're working on our 1st document. It's a, a guide to added repair and we meet the uh, 1st Wednesday of every month. <clears throat> but our next meeting is going to be uh, the last Wednesday uh, in June and that's because of the uh, July 4th holiday. Next. Okay, <clears throat> so we've been in the process of establishing the, uh, the framework that I spoke about for additive repair. Now the, in the bottom right corner is sort of a sneak preview or sneak peek at what the that framework is, is uh, starting to look like, and I'll go over that in, in a few minutes. So, in order to uh, um, to help us do that, we've set up a fictional repair scenario, and we're using that to uh, to help us establish the appropriate framework uh, for additive repair. So it's a framework that's going to be similar to the framework established established for both the metals and uh, non-metals additive committees. And uh, so we've agree we have agreed to include three types of repair scenarios. So the first one is repair of a conventional part. So you can imagine a forging or casting uh, part on an airplane that gets damaged uh, and needs to be repaired. So that's where we would use additive for that. The second scenario is repair of an additive part. So a part that has been made using an additive manufacturing process that would look and behave and perform uh, the same as a conventional part. But because it's an additive part, um, it's basically uh, becoming a, a second uh, scenario. So we would uh, develop a repair for that. So there may be things specific to additive or to additive parts that would have to be uh, considered. And then the, the final uh, scenario is where the additive part is consumed by repair. So you can imagine making a complete part using the additive process that either gets bolted or welded to an existing part and becomes uh, a part of that assembly, uh, meaning that it gets consumed in that assembly. So for now, we are focusing initially on the scenario. Uh, number one, where we're taking a conventional TIE 64 part and using either laser or plasma DED processes uh, and utilizing either wire or powder as feedstock uh, to repair the part. And we think that this scenario would be extendable to other AMO uh, modalities, including a uh, powder bed and even coal spray. And coal spray is a, uh, it may not be considered an additive process for some, it's more like a coating process, but uh, coal spray is into the point where they're actually making features that could be considered uh, structural or uh, would uh, provide some sort of engineering function. So therefore, uh, they are considered more of an additive type uh, process. So again, uh, we do have 70 members and we're always looking for more, uh, more active members and uh, collaborators. Next slide. 
So, just real quickly, uh, when we started the document, it was only one uh, document, then it turned into two documents, but then we combined both of those documents and even added an appendix uh, for, uh, for both out of scenarios and for uh, information that, that we would think would be useful to the, uh, the out of repair process. And so we've been working on that document at the same time. Uh, we spent a lot of time covering two topics, uh, and that is park criticality and uh, park qualification. Next slide. So this shows an outline of the document. There's basically eight sections, but it's sections four through six are the main bulk of the uh, of the document. So section four is repair consideration. So this is when you're considering repair or doing a repair and, and basically what you should consider when uh, doing that evaluation. And then section five is what you would go through in order to develop a repair and qualify it. And then section six is and it, uh, basically a step through uh, example of what you would do in a repair process. And then again, uh, appendices, appendices one and two would, would be example repair scenarios and then useful information uh, for the, the uh, repair. Next. So this chart here, it's one of my favorites. I always show it. Um, and so it's basically showing that additive is basically uh, the same as any other material fabrication processes. So in terms of processing microstructure and then properties and performance, and really we want to create standards that uh, ensure that we have quality and consistency in the product. Next slide. So additive really covers a broad range of materials. So on the far left is a commodity, which would have basically homogeneous uh, equiax type uh, material properties to behave very similar to a forging or it could be in the middle where you have uh, basically a, a continuous material, but it, it has directional properties. And uh, the third column would be a composite material where you actually have discrete phases and the material is anisotropic and, and, and homogeneous. So we started on the far left as a added committee and then uh, have been working to incorporate this broad range of, of materials. Next slide. And so added repair itself is what I would consider a combination of these uh, different uh, groups. So on the left, you have the commodity material. That could be your, your base or substrate or the part that you're actually repairing, which would be the TIE-64 forging with this Equiax microstructure. And then the additive material would take on a more of a directional type of microstructure, very similar to what you would see with welds. And because typically when you do a repair, you can't do a full high temperature heat treatment. So it would not, uh, reach a high enough temperature to fully recrystallize, or it might be a material that does not recrystallize. And so therefore you would end up with this uh, directional type microstructure. Next slide. And the end result for the whole part basically is that it would be a composite. Oh, I'm sorry, I think you got ahead of me. Go back one slide, please. What I was trying to point out here was that uh, the, the combination of the uh, the, the base material being a commodity material and the deposit being a uh, directional material combined would form a composite structure. So basically you get all three processes for the price of one. So here, I'm oh, sorry, the next slide. So this shows the uh, standard or current hierarchy for our AM specification. So at the top level, you have the material specification and then it calls out a process specification, which the process itself would be materially agnostic or material agnostic. And then uh, the material spec would also call out a feedstock specification. Typically that'd be a powder or a wire. And then that feedstock material specification would call out a, a feedstock process specification. So there's a hierarchy there, um, defines requirements, establishes controls, and then for the most part, it's performance based. So you have to uh, basically establish your process and it's substantiated. Um, there is some uh, prescriptive information that's usually contained in the material specific uh, specifications like the uh, material spec and the powder specification. Now, the process specs themselves basically uh, establish the framework and the controls to, uh, that need to be in place in order to ensure consistency and, and quality. So next slide. And this just shows our AMS specs overlaid on top of that uh, hierarchy. So the top one is the AMS 7000 laser powder bed fusion alloy 625, which is a material spec or component spec. And uh, it calls out the, the uh, 
AMS 7003, which is the laser powder bed process specification, which can be used for alloy 625, 718, type 64. So that's material agnostic. And then it also calls out the feedstock material specification. So this is AMS 7001, 625 powder, which also calls out the AMS 7002 powder manufacturing process specification. So again, 7000, 7001 would be more prescriptive. 7003 and 7002 are more uh, performance based. And again, you have to establish your process, substantiate it, and lock it down. Next slide. And this is just a flow chart version of that same hierarchy. And at the top, uh, we have the uh, the start of the requirements, the highest level of the requirements and, and their precedence. So it would be the PO, statement of work, and the part drawing. And that would call out the uh, material spec, which calls out the sub-tier specifications underneath that, which flow all the way down to the, the PC, PCD, which is our process control do document, or what is uh, the fixed process, also known as the recipe. Go to the next slide. And this just shows the AMS framework and then the specifications overlaid on top of the flow down uh, requirements. Okay, so next slide. So for new make parts, um, what this slide shows is on the left is the basic framework and one instantiation of it. And then the next two are basically uh, other instantiations of the uh, of the framework. And it's just really showing the flexibility. So on the far left is very flexible. You have a process control document and that's established by the supplier and uh, substantiated. Whereas the second column is a public PCD where the PCD itself is a specification. So that fixed process is in the public domain and you have to follow that re uh, recipe specifically. And then the third column is just where you might uh, create a, a standard material using the process, but then it would undergo different heat treatments. So therefore would have uh, a, a different uh, capability or performance and required a separate material specification for, for each of those. So if you're using different heat treatments, like you do hip only, or if you do hip and stress relief, if you do solution treat and age, or if you do direct age, those would be all different, uh, uh, I guess, heat treatments applied to the same base material. So the base material will be made to the, uh, to the, to the, the general uh, PCD and then, or to the same PCD, but then, Post-processing would be done to different uh, processes requirements and therefore would just result in different material and would require uh, separate material specifications. So just again, a different example of how you could use this framework to meet a, a specific situation. So going to the next slide, now I'm showing how we are uh, evolving or developing the repair uh, hierarchy. So it's very similar in some degree to the uh, to the existing framework. And in, in green, we have the process and uh, the, the feedstock material specifications, which are uh, can be leveraged from the materials and non, sorry, the metals and non metal subcommittees as is. So we can take a repair process, we can use L, the laser powder bed fusion process. Uh, and so we could use AMS 7000, or if it's a DED process like. Uh, laser DED, we can use uh, 7010 or as a plasma based uh, DED process, then we can use AMS 7005. So in green are uh, specifications that we can leverage from the existing uh, framework. Where we run into a problem or an issue is, in, is with the component or the final material specification. So that's why that's in yellow, the bottom box on that left column. And so that is what we are working on uh, and incorporating into our document is how to address the uh, the uh, final uh, component, the final repair of the material for that. Next slide. So here just highlighting again that uh, the feedstock and the fin uh, finished product specifications can be, uh, can be somewhat prescriptive, uh, whereas the process specifications are performance-based. And again, that's really what's going to happen with the repair process. And, and we see that substantiating the final material um, is, is going to be a major focus challenge uh, for, for these specifications. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, we had spent time, a considerable amount of time talking about uh, part criticality and uh, qualification uh, slash certification, what that means. And so uh, those things need to be considered when evaluating whether or not you're going to perform repair. What is the criticality of the uh, of the application? And then so we spent time talking about that. How would we uh, 
define criticality and how would we assign it? Uh, we looked at park classification, park families. We, we've had those discussions and we collaborated with other SDOs on that and other uh, uh, organizations outside of, of SAE. Um, and then that all affects a qualification certification. So basically, the more critical the application, uh, the more effort, the more cost, uh, the more time is going to be spent on the qualification or the certification of that application. Next slide. So not only do you need to consider it when you're evaluating whether or not to do the repair, but then as you also are developing and qualifying repair, obviously that's going to be a significant uh, factor in, in that process. Next slide. So just touching on park criticality again, uh, so this is leveraged from AMS 7032 for machine qualification. So we have the IQ, OQ, MQ, PQ. And so IQ, OQ are really the initial and the operational qualification. That's the machine itself on the shop floor. MQ, PQ is really uh, the material qualification, the park qualification, and that's uh, beyond the scope of, of, of really 7032. But um, what you can see in the table below is that uh, the more critical the application, the more that's going to have to go into qualifying uh, that application. And then on the, the right side, it can also affect decisions uh, as to what happens when you have uh, and you're looking at whether or not this is a repair or if this is a uh, modification and then uh, what the effect that has on the uh, on the qualification. Next slide. And so this slide is, uh, basically lists of the, the things that need to be considered under uh, criticality, qualification, and certification. And again, also on alteration versus repair and, and major versus minor. Again, the main takeaway is that uh, the more critical the application, uh, the more intensive the qualification and the certification will be. And it can also affect uh, what happens when you are looking at it as an alteration versus repair. Is it a major versus minor? Uh, what needs to be done in order to uh, to substantiate and qualify if it is uh, a, a repair, considered a, sorry, an alteration and a, a major one at that. So that's basically where we are right now. So the next slide. So um, if you have any questions, feel free, free to reach out to me. Uh, uh, again, if you're interested, our next meeting at the, is at the end of the, uh, this month and we are looking for uh, additional collaborators to assist us in, in creating those standards for, for repair. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, very much for sharing all of the activities of the AM Repair Subcommittee. Again, if you have questions for Dave, feel free to reach out to him direct or pop them into the chat feature. Our next speaker is Ethan Aikens, Senior Business Development Manager Aerospace at the Performance Review Institute. Ethan's going to speak about the additive manufacturing NADCAP aerospace and defense contractors accreditation program. So welcome, Ethan. Thanks, Becky. Um, so my name is Ethan Akins, obviously the senior business development manager of aerospace at the Performance Review Institute. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about where additive manufacturing is currently within the NADCAP program. So Becky, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what the NACAP program is, where added manufacturing is currently at in the NACAP program. Um, a couple of the supplemental processes that we accredit to that support additive manufacturing, and then what's next for additive manufacturing in the program. Next slide. Uh, so a little background about the NACAP program. It was established in 1990 by Aerospace uh, Original Equipment Manufacturers, or OEMs, to do supply chain oversight of critical processes. Um, the main goal is to reduce redundant audits, um, help mitigate risks within the supply chain, validate the performances, and ensure compliance. It is a program recognized by the FAA and EASA. And um, a, a little thing I like to tell people all the time right now is it has evolved from being the National Aerospace and Defense Contractors Accreditation Program to being more of an international program. So it's now a global program. So it went from being in all capitals to now just a capital N ADCAP. Next slide. 
Um, NACA program is an industry managed program. So what that means is much like the SAE committees, it's a consensus based audit criteria that's developed by industry and government experts. Um, uh, they define the requirements from their individual companies and industry specifications. And that PRI then goes out and audits the companies um, to those criteria so that they develop. The experts from the industry and government then review those audit criteria and recognize those suppliers. And then they're given a accreditation or certificate to say that they um, have the processes, the critical processes that meet those criteria. Next slide. Right now we're up to 58 subscribers. You can see we've talked about some of these uh, earlier in the day. Um, I believe we will be adding an additional one in two weeks away, actually up to 59 subscribers. Uh, again, a global organization, you can see subscribers there from Europe, Asia, and, and of course the Americas. Next slide. Right now in the NACA program, we have 23 commodities. So these are the special processes or the critical processes that we go out and audit to and give accreditations to. If you look across those, you notice you don't see additive manufacturing on there right now. And that's because when we first started looking at additive manufacturing, it was moved into the welding task group to start looking at it. Uh, in fact, if you go to the next slide, kind of highlighted it down there. Um, so right now we have one process for added manufacturing and it's an accreditation within the welding task group. Next slide. So we'll talk about added manufacturing in the program right now. Next slide. So when we look at added manufacturing, there's three main things that we look at is the manufacturing processes, the technologies and the materials. So when the program and the program stakeholders originally started looking at this back in 2013, um, a lot of specifications weren't developed yet. It was still an emerging technology. So within all those manufacturing process technologies and materials, currently we have one accredited process for that. Uh, Becky, if you want to go, I believe three clicks. Um, it's powder bed fusion for direct metal laser melting, electron beam melting for metals only. So that is what the one checklist covers. We are currently looking at other processes as well, but right now that's where the program started at. Next slide. So when we look at where it started way back in 2013, our welding task group was assigned by the NACAP Management Council to look at additive manufacturing and see what processes um, potentially could be there for the supply chain management. Um, that's almost a decade ago. And when we heard some of the earlier speakers talk, a lot of the big changes in additive manufacturing has really happened within the last five years. We're getting more of these specifications out, more of the processes. We're looking now more at uh, plastics and composites or non-metallic additive manufacturing. So right now we have the one checklist for the laser electron beam metallic powder bed manufacturing. They started looking at it in 2013. Um, the first accreditation there wasn't until uh, May of 2017. So it took four years to develop that first audit criteria. Get out there, try out the audit criteria, train the auditor, approve it through the program and actually get to that first supplier and give that accreditation out. Next slide. So when we look at the welding group and, and the subscribers and, and the personnel involved, um, when, when atom manufacturing is discussed in welding, it's always a very busy day, it's always a full room. You can see we have 15, 16 subscribers to the program. They're all involved in the creation of that uh, audit criteria and involvement in out of manufacturing. Um, some additional support came from some of the suppliers uh, that were also involved within that group. Right now, we currently have 11 accredited suppliers throughout the, the world. You can see them, what, the four in the United States, a few in, in Europe, one up there in Canada. Um, Next slide. So where it's at right now within the welding group is they're looking at a Rev C revision and that's taking feedback from going out and performing the audits from the subscribers, from the auditees that have been audited to improve that audit criteria. Um, they're also doing regular uh, updates on the handbook, again, with feedback from stakeholders. 
Uh, currently, there's no no looking at a new process or new additional checklist because uh, how long it took to make the AC seven one one zero slash fourteen. Plus the fact there's very few accreditations to it right now. Um, we need to get more subscriber involvement and commitment so we can help grow this and move this technology on a little bit better. Next slide. So if we look at supplemental processes, next slide. So in an ACAP program, again, we have 23 various uh, special processes that we credit to. One of the groups, the Metallic Materials Manufacturing Task Group, is actually in process of working on an audit criteria for the manufacture of the powder material for additive manufacturing. Um, that audit criteria should be going out to ballot uh, of June of 2022, so we should be seeing some movement with that um, by the end of the year. If we look at the other commodities as well, and these are more support processes for the additive manufacturing. So it's not really manufacturing, but the the, the hipping of the part afterwards. Um, we have chemical process with chemical milling, and that's you know like deburring the edges and making sure that we meet the dimensionals. Um, we have non-destructive testing for various uh, testing, and right now they're looking at doing a CT scanning audit criteria. Um, again, non-conventional machining, machining is a special process, measurement inspection, all these, these supplemental processes that are involved with the attic manufacturing process as a whole. Next slide. So what's next? So what's going on within the NACAP program right now? So within the program right now, we have our June meeting in London in two weeks. And at that meeting, there will be discussion with the NACAP Management Council about what to do with additive manufacturing right now. As it has advanced so much in the last, say, five years, it's time to take a look at it and see, is, is there other processes that we should be looking to have audit criteria for? And should it be within the welding task group? I think it's, it's come, uh, light years since we started looking at this in 2013 and potentially has enough standings to be a, a task group on itself, which is additive manufacturing for metallic and non-metallic uh, processes. Um, we're taking a look at the NACAP stakeholders needs. So how many of those subscribers or those OEMs are using external suppliers for additive manufacturing right now? As this is an audit criteria or an auditing of supply chain for those OEMs, um, a lot of them are right now looking and starting to experiment and use some external suppliers. So there's more of a need to start looking at this uh, setup of a program for this oversight. Um, Technology is changing nonstop. Uh, the various machines. From the speakers earlier, you hear about the um, the new specifications, the new processes, the new materials. So it's looking at that all and having that discussion to see what's the next step for the program and what does the industry need right now. Um, again, we're constantly monitoring technology trends, manufacturing processes, technologies, materials, um, speaking with SEE International and SEE ITC on the processes that they're working on. Uh, myself and the composite staff engineer just attended the SAMPI convention two weeks ago to see what's the latest within composites and what's going on with out of manufacturing and non-metallics. So we're investigating it all to see what the next steps are, but hopefully in two weeks when we have that discussion with the NACAP uh, Management Council, it will give a more direction to the program. Next slide. Oh, cool. I thought, I, I Becky, I thought I could save you some time. Uh, so if you have any if you have any questions or you want any more information about the NACAP program and where we stand, um, simply email NACAPinfo at p-r-i.org, or you can get in touch with myself. Um, Becky will have my information. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ethan. And again, if you have questions for Ethan, please pop them into the chat feature or contact him directly. Our next speaker is Tim Davison, Corporate Sales for SE International. Tim's going to demonstrate the SE Mobilis and SE OnQ digital standard systems. Welcome, Tim. Hey, good morning there, Becky. Um, thanks for allowing me the, uh, the quick time here. We've got five minutes to cover uh, our platforms here. Um, where I come into play here, I work with uh, customers like yourselves, uh, providing access to our standards. Uh, the, the folks who have spoken here earlier and 
great topic. Uh, they're basically talking about how to be involved with the committees and how the, they produce these standards. Uh, where I come into play, I am working with companies to allow them to have access to these standards, whether they're a corporate solution uh, or maybe a smaller uh, subset of specs, uh, maybe one of our pack products. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and turn the next page here, Beck. Uh, SAE Mobilis is our web platform where we house all of our publications, whether they're AMS standards, aerospace standards, which I imagine is going to be most important to you. Uh, we also have um, ground vehicle standards, our edge reports. They're kind of unsettled topics, new new topics going on in industry that maybe there's no standards on those uh, of that interest yet. So. And then we also have journals and tech papers. Um, the one thing that, uh, you know, Jonathan talked about earlier, that I wanted to point out, he had mentioned the MMP uh, DS and also the CMH 17 books. Uh, those, those are also available on the SAE Mobilis as a subscription. So that's something to think of um, as a opportunity to be able to subscribe to those. Um, go ahead and turn the next page there, Beck. And go ahead one more. So we can talk about on. I think I have on Q on there. So SAE on Q, uh, a little bit different. Typically, what you what you're familiar with right now is working with PDF documents. Uh, they're kind of static. You can do a Control F and search for what you're looking for uh, in the actual PDF document. Uh, what's nice about SAE on Q is when we're digitizing those PDF files into digital format. So we're extracting everything out of the tables. Uh, that could be anything that relates to the composition, uh, can also be maybe the tensile strength, and also it gets into the requirements. Uh, two different ways that you can actually access this information. One is with the SAE on Q platform. It's our, um, our website that you can go in and search for this information sim similar to SAE Mobilis. Uh, the other way we actually provide this information with is an API. We're actually able to feed this information from our site over into your system where you can embed it into like a door system. Um, so it really helps allow making it limits the errors going back and forth and trans uh, transporting of the information, retyping things. So. Um, if this is something you're interested in looking at, um, we actually have a sales rep who mostly focuses on SE on Q. I can put you in uh, contact with him. It's Mark Wynn. Um, but if there's any need for SAE standards as a whole, uh, that would be you want to reach out to me. It's uh, Tim D at SAE.org. Other than that, Beck, that's all I have. Thank you, Tim, for that overview of both systems there. Again, if you have questions for either SE Mobilis or the OnQ Digital Standards System, please reach out to Tim. And we also have additional SE additive manufacturing resources that we would like to share with you today. We just released hot off the presses on this last Friday, the latest SE Tomorrow Today podcast on accelerating the adoption of additive manufacturing from John Barnes, the founder and managing partner of the Barnes Global Advisors. This is episode 113 of this podcast series, and John will discuss the evolution of additive manufacturing, including Pittsburgh's 91 neighborhood, the first development in the world to connect and condense all components of the 3D printing supply chain into one powerful production ecosystem. So click and enjoy listening to this new podcast. We also have a series of SE Edge reports that were mentioned earlier today on unsettled topics. And these are just a sampling of some of the unsettled topics around additive manufacturing. As you can see here, they're, they're an, it's a long series that we encourage you to uh, go on the SE website and just search for SE Edge reports. You'll pull up all of these unsettled topics around additive manufacturing. Another resource are the additive manufacturing books published by SAE. There are a couple of those uh, listed here on this screen, but again, just go to the SAE website. You can search additive manufacturing and a whole series of resources will pop up for you. We have technical papers. These are also available through the SAE website, but there's a long series of technical papers talking about the latest and greatest in additive manufacturing. And then we have some training programs also. 
So just some of the resources that SE has available, we encourage everyone to go online and check those out. And then I have some information on how to get involved with the SE Aerospace Standards Program. So we heard from several speakers today talking about all of the many activities going on in additive manufacturing standards development. This is the big overall org chart for SE Standards Committees. Additive manufacturing is one of the big pieces on this org chart. But if you're interested, the, there are many benefits to participating on a standards committee. It gives you a, a voice in the uh, expert arena when it comes to standards development. You can influence the global aerospace market. You can contribute to the development and the content of a standard. It gives you the ability to network with customers, partners, peers, suppliers, regulators. So lots of different benefits to getting involved. And if you're interested, we do encourage you to reach out. Our standards development process is a very streamlined global process where a need is identified. We form a global standards committee. We go through the balloting process and at the output is a standard, a publication that is pushed out to the global marketplace. So it's a very streamlined process. You heard earlier, it takes approximately on average 18 months. Some standards take a little longer and some standards take a little less to reach publication. Process for getting involved. Uh, if you wanna get involved in any standards committee or if you're specifically in, uh, interested in an additive manufacturing committee, contact Carrie Rohall. Carrie's address is listed here, carrie.rohall at sae.org for additional details, or you have my information, contact me directly and I can help you get connected with a standards committee. So now we'll move into our question and answer session. We do encourage you to pop questions into the chat feature. I'm going to check back through here real quick to see where we have some questions. Uh, I see one from Kevin saying, I work in machine vision, machine learning, AI, related edge computing. Has there been any effort to incorporate more of this technology, including machine vision in robotic systems? And I, I see there was some, something of a uh, discussion online here, but would anyone like to address that question verbally? Becky, this is Bill. Uh, I sent him a note uh, in addition to what Dave and Paul added. There's some activities outside of 3D printing, additive manufacturing, SAE, that we're looking at. And Jonathan uh, and I have been looking at modeling efforts. It's called MBSC, Model Based Systems Engineering, to help complement uh, the manufacturing process. And that's, the, he talked about machine vision and, and robotics. So that might be a, a little closer aligned to, to what. Uh, uh, this gentleman's interested in so he can contact me i sent him that that information and for the record since he's uh, still online uh paul jonas had had put a, information in the, the chat but another thing at, at NIAR uh, that they're they're doing it's called the atlas advanced manufacturing uh, system or ecosystem i guess and paul could talk to that in more detail but kevin you you might want to look into what NIAR is doing because that's probably going to get much more clo uh, much closer to uh, your robotic system and, and machine vision. I don't know, Paul, if you want to talk to that. That's above and beyond uh, 3D printing because it's not just limited to, to that. Yeah, uh, Bill, it's a little bit, it, it's more in the uh, robotic and uh, automated manufacturing, fiber placement, filament placement technologies, and uh, quite a bit of work with vision systems and AI machine learning to help op optimize those particular parts. So, um, yeah, Kevin, if you uh, want a little bit more information, we'll get you uh, to Dr. 17 over at the uh, Atlas uh, lab, and they can tell you to what's going on a little bit over. Great, thank you for that. And I see one other question that was popped in here towards the end. What impact will President Biden's AM forward have on NADCAP coverage for additives? Should we be anticipating a jump in demand for NADCAP accreditation? Ethan, maybe you can help with that one. Ethan dropped off. Ah, but yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm going to, to uh, just mention that um, 
Dave has been <laughs> kind of bombarded by by phone calls. So if we could use anecdote as any evidence of of and Dave oversees kind of like the suppliers at, at GE. So uh, if that's one data point, um, but it would be interesting if Ethan still were on the call to see where you know NADCAP's role in in helping facilitate this because really nobody knows the details of of the president's proposal because there isn't any funds tied to this, uh, but there's at least initial energy and excitement. And we believe that standards will play an important role to help, uh, you know, drive some of this adoption because we're trying to drive down cost and create commonality across the supply chain. Thank you for that response. We will share this question with Ethan and uh, see if we can get a response from him that I can push out to everyone on the call. Well, I wonder if Dave could just elaborate briefly to the extent that you could you could talk about what's happened um, from your standpoint with with GE. But I know there's GE's one of the names that had committed to to support President Biden's uh, initiative amongst uh, other OEMs. But any any. Yes. So we're already being contacted by SMEs regarding becoming suppliers for uh, 2GE for, for additive. And I am uh, the lead auditor for special processes uh, related to additive. And uh, we're very limited in terms of the uh, number of auditors uh, that we have and the number of audits that we can perform. And so uh, I can see that uh, there will be a, a need for additional uh, oversight or assistance uh, regarding our suppliers. So I think that this is an opportunity and I'm curious as to how NADCAP um, sees that, that playing out right now. And again, what they're going to do, uh, what their plans are in terms of supporting that. It will be very interesting to see how NADCAP addresses this going forward. Yeah, and Ethan just sent me an email, so I'm responding, I'll copy you, Dave, and I suspect we could take this discussion offline too. So. Great, thanks. All right, thank you all. Those are the only questions I see in the chat feature. We'll give it a few more seconds to see if anyone wants to pop a question in there. And then uh, I'll start into the wrap up here. Uh, we do have a series of resources that we will provide to everyone who called in. We will provide the, the full presentation slide deck. We'll have a survey going out for this webinar. And we did record today's webinar, so we will provide a link to that video as soon as that is available. And then if you would like to connect with the Ohio Aerospace Institute or with SAE International, our details are listed here. So feel free to reach out. But other than that, OAI and SAE, thank you for participating in today's additive manufacturing webinar. Feel free to reach out with any questions subsequent to the webinar and watch for the resources to be pushed out to you. Thanks again and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Becky. Cheers. Thanks, Becky.